One. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy Skip, aka Skip and Tosh here. Back to talk about some more Fantastic Four, Fantastic Four Volume 3. And there is three of us here, as you can obviously see and count. If you are watching the video and not listening to the audio only, which either one of them I appreciate. But I have with me my twin. Why don't you go ahead and say what's up to the people, twin? What's up, everybody? It's Fantastic Zach here. Here to talk about some Fantastic Four. Going to be a good time. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I actually, this is the book. These are the books that I read two weeks ago when I thought that this was the volume two that we were going to be covering. So I had to actually go back and reread them to make sure they stayed fresh. So I've been preparing for this night much longer than, uh, than some of the other books that I've read. So would you say you've been waiting for this moment for all your life? All my life, yes. Uh, for the last two weeks or two and a half weeks, yes. Thank you, Phil Collins. I mean, twin. And now we're going <laughs> down to our uh, our good buddy, Mister On Comics himself, our buddy Ash. Ash, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing pretty good. I don't know why people call me Mister On Comics, but yeah, you're right. It's Mister Comics. On it, should, your middle. it should be Mister Comics. Yeah, yeah. On would be the middle. It's the middle on, part. On it's. It's a descriptor. It's it's like doing something. Never mind. Yeah, you're doing comics. I feel like, I feel like literally every, on I them. made this. I I created this name, and no, it's like no one gets it, and I feel bad because you can't undo it. Nope. What's done is YouTube done. YouTube won't let you. Then, I, unless... but on the other hand, you mm -hmm. see what you did. You gave yourself your own nickname. You're not supposed to do that. Other people are supposed to give you your nickname. How do you start least... a channel? Oh, I, I, that's, I a, that's a buttons, good point. My friend, yeah. buttons. That's that's. Buttons. You need to take that to the F, Google FAQ. Take that to YouTube. I'm just gonna go by AOC. AOC. Okay. Oh no. There you go. Because that's not taken already. That's perfect. It's a mantle. Yeah. It's, it's a, a mantle. mantle. It, it's, it, a mantle. It, it's a legacy. It's you like love legacies. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm a, a I'm a you I'm a male it. AOC. The <laughs> male version. <laughs> You're I'm a male AOC. You know how like there's there's male Wolverine and now there's like X twenty three is the female Wolverine. Yes, that's who he is. Ash is right, the male exactly. AOC. Right. Ash yeah. on comics. This is perfect. I love yeah. it. I love West, it. West Coast AOC. This is perfect. <laughs> All right. Well. Also Northern European. That works because the other one is the East Coast. So yeah, you're the West Coast <laughs> male AOC. West West Coast AOC. <laughs> Oh, oh this is perfect this stream only gets better and better and better again everybody thank you for for joining us for this discussion um similar to the format from the very last time um, we're going to give our initial thoughts from there we're going to jump into the three moments of this particular uh run or i should say this section of it because this is fantastic Four. Hey, jonathan hickman's fantastic four volume three we'll talk about the three most impactful moments to us that stood out the most We'll wrap it up. We'll give our thoughts on after that. And for people that are joining us live on Twitch, because we do record this live on twitch.tv backslash Skip and Tosh, S-K-I-P-N-T-O-S-H. That is in the description below as well if you want to check that out. Um, we usually go a little bit longer after it, and we extend the stream and talk about other comics-related stuff. So join us there if you enjoy this conversation and want to hear three rad dudes talk about some rad or not so rad books like space lady have you heard of that book probably haven't probably <laughs> should be reading it come here and talk about it all righty and on that note i am going over to my twin twin you've double read this book within the last two weeks how did it hit you this time initial thoughts and also did you pick anything up from this most current reading from this week that you didn't grab last week yeah, so uh, so yeah, so fun story. Uh, when Skip was like, "Yeah, we'll, we'll do like volume one of the Hickman run this week, and then we'll do volume two, and so on." So when I went to go find Hickman volume two on Comicsology, I ended up finding the complete collection volume two, 
which skipped the issues that we read last week. So when I was reading through it, I was like, wait a second, this is weird. Why is Sue in this place called Old Atlantis? Where did this come from? Where did the mole kids come from? Like, there were all these parts that just like popped up out of nowhere seemingly so then when i went back and read the issues that we discussed last week i was like oh this is where all these spots came from i see uh but no yeah reading through this i mean this is a good little it's a good little uh good little section of books i i doesn't have a whole whole, it feels almost like like there's one particular story and I know it's not filler because it's Hickman. Hickman doesn't do filler, but uh, it, it'll have payoff or it'll have something down the road. But oh, yes. uh, some of it, it, it's it was very much like uh, the story is in transition. We're we're adding these pieces. We're adding some ingredients to the gumbo pot. Yeah. Uh, hashtag Louisiana life, and uh, you know it's going to come to fruition down the road. There there's some parts in here that I really really loved but they at least in the moment seem like that stand there's two stories in particular i'm thinking of that we'll talk about uh one is very much centered around human torch uh with franklin and then the other one has to do with reed and ben and um and dr doom and they seem like very kind of just standalone isolated stories but then i know as we go further down the line hickman's gonna be like hey you remember this do you remember like things that were said or actions that were done we're gonna bring that back but right now i'm just gonna have you think it's like a filler episode of a of a show but uh but yeah no this was it was a really really good little section of books really good little really good couple of books here i mean god dog it's just so we we see um you know reed start to form the future foundation which is gonna be hickman's other little sister title to the fantastic four uh, which is in a, on its own a fun story. I don't remember being too interested in Future Foundation back when it was first coming out. Uh, I don't know what what my thinking was, but I just remember not being too interested in it. But now I'm just like, give me anything with Hickman's name on it, and <laughs> and let me read it, and I'll be happy. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I can tell you that your relationship to Future Foundation before suffered from your reading of the ultimate collection volume two without but mm-hmm. missing the trade paperback four issues of the actual volume yeah. two i assure you exactly as yeah. they get filled in all of that stuff makes a lot more sense and means so much more in the scale of things but reading through this i can uh and, and like i i was with you because when i was first reading these i kind of felt a little similar too i was like Oh yeah, you know some filler issues, but Hickman filler issues is is better than majority of other people's fill, filler issues. You know, depending on how he handles it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, and these were handled fine. I just felt like I was getting again like kind of episode episodic, you know, little things. And then I obviously knew some of the other stuff was like some build up just because the way that he introduced it. But oh yeah. my gosh, yeah, no, he th- none of this was wasted. Let me tell you that. But on that mm-hmm. note. Mr. Ash, talk to me West a little Coast bit AOC about uh, you. West, Ca- West Coast AOC. I'm just kidding. I stand corrected. <laughs> Excuse uh. me. Let me let me present your actual title, Mr. West Coast AOC. Um, yeah. What what were your initial thoughts as you read through these four issues? My initial thoughts were, this is the Hickman that I remember even though he did it afterwards from Hawks Pox. Mm-hmm. These four issues felt a lot more of the writing style. Cause I was introduced to Jonathan Hickman through house of X powers of X. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure I've never read any of his stuff before then. So that was kind of my um, coming, you know, of age moment and people being like, you've never read Hickman Ash. You don't know. And I was like, all right. Let me let me be educated. Let me and I tried and I was like, holy cow, I see what everyone's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the Fantastic Four, I was really digging because it had, you know, the speaking of the previous two volumes, it had a lot of that excitement. Like it had it was just it actually those those issues felt a lot more what I got out of East of West, a lot more of just like epic storytelling. 
mm-hmm. um, not as cerebral. Although everything Hickman does is cerebral to an extent, to a degree. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, East of West felt like just a bigger epic, like story, um, and the the Fantastic Four felt like it was building to something in a similar fashion. Then I get to these four issues, and it's like. I don't want to. It's not really exposition, but it was a lot of, um, yeah, yeah, a lot of explanation. There like was a lot a, yeah, of there just, was a lot more exposition in this than in the the previous one. A lot sure. of just yeah, a lot of yeah. cerebral just explanation, uh, and just like just crunchy sci-fi stuff that that the Hawks yeah. Pox really got into with the whole singularities and the yes. time. You know, you're just like what the. So this this uh, storyline just, especially when it gets to New Earth and it's going through the future, and I was like, oh, this really reminds me of the whole Powers of X thing, how he did the similar thing where advancing through time and different stages of time. Yes, and very difficult to digest, which mm-hmm. to some people that's a turn off, but to me, I really dig it. I I am not a person who minds reading something on the first try and not getting it all. I really like when I can go back to something and be like, "Oh man, this is making more sense now." Like I I like being challenged. Now I don't want something to be overly sophisticated for just the sake of feeling over, you know? Right. Because some people do that, and I basically think that's being pretentious. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't think Hickman does that. I think that he's just really big brainy sometimes and he likes to i think he's probably really well read uh, on certain things and you know scientific things and he likes to take what he knows and puts these in his these fantasy stories yes um but some of these concepts are pretty high level things um and so the way he structures the story sometimes is difficult to follow but he does also put interesting plot arcs in there so it's not just like you're not just reading a textbook of like oh this is how quantum mechanics work like you're it's in it, 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 you know one of my favorite writers of all time in, not in comics but just novel writers is michael crichton he does a similar thing he's mm-hmm. extremely right. w- knowledgeable scientific i mean you know everyone knows jurassic park whether you've read the book or not everyone's probably seen the movie. book is way better than you know that movie. that was written in the 90s before Sorry. Yeah, it's better. But but just the idea, like you read Jurassic Park, and, and you know today it's old news, but in the '90s it was bleeding edge. Mm-hmm. You read Jurassic Park and you felt like you understood how cloning worked when you were done. Like you felt like you you didn't feel like you had been through a class in the sense that you were like bored. Like it wasn't, but you felt like you had that education. And many of his books are that way. I read like his book Timeline, which is probably his most Hickman esque type book and i felt like i think i'm like i think time travel will work now like i think i could (laughs) time travel makes sense to me and i'm like what am i thinking but he made it make sense and hickman does similar things like he makes these advanced concepts seem almost touchable Mm -hmm. um and i like that 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 was a really long uh you know verbose uh you know answer to your question but that was my all my first thoughts about this Hey, I asked the question. I wanted the answer. So no, I appreciate it. And it um yeah, it touched on a lot of the things that I felt too as I was reading the run. <clears throat> or excuse me, reading it. Um actually well, yeah, when I first read it, you know, because I mean Hickman's stuff is is fairly potent. So you get a lot of the as, as far as like the, the 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 ways that you feel about it or the things that you run into while reading it usually are similar all those times over, but it's, for me, it was like smaller details and stuff, you know, as I'm reading it, whatever the third or fourth time over now that, you know, that I'm picking up this time, but same, it was, it was, uh, it was a little more dense. It was a little more plot driven. There was, um, fewer character moments, but they were, they were still definitely in there. And some of the ones that don't seem like they mean as much, let me tell you that that's that, that he's just putting money in the bank for later. Um, and I, I did appreciate how it was, I mean, since the beginning, like it started off, it started off sci-fi, but it felt more fanta- fantastical. Like it, f- it felt a little bit more of the like fantasy than, than, than the science, even though it's like a science-based character. 
And then as we go on, like the second volume to me felt even more like we were really digging into like sci-fi, like I said, kind of episodic type stories. Um, you know, some of the stuff that I used to watch on TV and all the, you know, Danger Mr. Wilson or all, whatever, you know, like that family. I forgot what it was called, but like it felt more like I lost was, in space, lost in space. It felt more like I was experiencing yeah. some of that, you know, which which I appreciated. And in this one, it was like even deeper in that way where like on that level where we we had like a few grounded stories, but he definitely took us like off in space and off into the future like, you know, leagues ahead and then dealt with some timey-wimey concepts to kind of, like, freak with us. But my biggest thing is that throughout all of that, um, he I, – and I like how he did it because it's there it's there all along, and it's easy to forget because we're used to the Fantastic Four being the Fantastic Four. But with, with, with him – well, I mean, you know, others expanded the family, but with him playing with the expanded family, you get to the end and you completely – I was completely reminded what it all comes back to, and it all comes back to family. He brought it all, like, we went through all the stuff that we went through in this volume, and at the, at the very end, he, he was express and explicit about reminding us, hey, this, this starts with the family, uh, and every arc, I'm going to remind you that it's, that it's about the family, and then the ultimate story ends with the theme of, of family, so... Even when it's right under our noses and I was even losing focus of it because I'm I'm trying to keep up with all the stuff that he's talking about and trying to show us all throughout that time. He was bringing mm -hmm. it back to back to family. So that's what ended up grounding it for me. And at the end where, where I was starting to think of some of those same things and I was like, yeah, that's right. Like we were way far out here and, you know, we're dealing with the TVA and, you know, we're dealing with the Mortis and, you know, all this other stuff. He brings it right back around to that, and I'm like, this grounds it all. This made, I literally felt like I didn't feel weightless anymore. I felt like I had weight, you know, because he brought it back to that. So on that note, we gave our initial thoughts. Thanks for that, gentlemen. But we're going to move on to some of these impactful moments. And, yeah, I'm going to have Twin start off. So Twin, what uh, out, of, out of three potential moments, what was one of the most okay. impactful that stood out to you? So, first of all, first impactful moment, and uh, I'm going to use impactful moment for two of these. I'm going to use them kind of just like in quotation when I say impactful. They, not that they aren't memorable or meaningful, but, you know, like I was saying, it's just – I with these particular issues, it's just most of them didn't have like that emotional impact – like that, ooh, I got just got punched in the heart type of feeling that I had with the previous, uh, you know, our previous issues that we had talked about. But uh, but there are still some some great ones in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one I have is one of those. So I'm I'm starting out in our first issue, which is uh, it's number five seventy nine, mm -hmm. and this is issue. This is the one where Reed is he's setting up and he's he's building up the future foundation. Mm -hmm. Um. The issue in the the scene I'm going for, so it's like right after this opening scene, Reed has just finished speaking at this big think tank conglomerate. Uh, pretty much, you know, Reed. It was actually very a very uh very. It felt a little off for Reed, but then as I thought about it, I was like, no, it actually does sound no, very much <laughs> like it's it, it's very much Reed. We were talking, it was like, this is basically Hickman writing Elon Musk, like current day Elon. He's like, <laughs> listen, you know, y'all are over here, and if I'm going to stay with y'all, then I have to regress. Like, it's almost like staying here with y'all is actually causing my intelligence to regress, and <laughs> yeah. I don't want it to. Y'all are holding so, me back. Y'all are retarding so, my progress. <laughs> I'm going to leave y'all here, and I'm going to go start my own thing. So this whole next scene... It's him, and it, he's got. I think this is Alex Powers, if I'm it not is. mistaken, from it from is. the Power Pack. Power Pack. And so, yeah. and so, th it's this panel right here, this one on the on the left hand side, where he's talking to Alex Powers, and Alex is like, Alex is he, he's not dumb, but he he's 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 kind of his wheels, his brains where he's like, listen, you're the smartest guy on earth. I don't know what I'm doing here. Like, you know, 
the only thing that I can really say is that I got a perfect grade on the SAT. You know, you're like the world's smartest guy. You save the world regularly. He's like, I'm just the dumb kid. Like, what am I doing here? And so Reed is like, listen, you're not here just because you're not like a charity case. I'm, you know, you're not here just to be like a mascot. You're here because you have meaning. You know, you may not see your potential, but Reed does see his potential. And that, I really dug that. You know, we see a lot of like how Reed treats his own kids and how he's a father to his own kids. But I actually really appreciated seeing this. I'm a big, big advocate of like mentorship and like big brother, big sister stuff. I'm a youth leader. So I, I work a lot, you know, and I, I hang out with a lot of teens in my in my church community. And so this was really cool because like Alex doesn't see like his own potential here. He doesn't see like how he can be of value to this thing that Reed is doing. And Reed's like, no, listen, you, you there's a plan. There's a reason that you're here. We're going to figure it out. And so he's like offering him this help and this, this path forward. So I really dug that. I thought that that was a, a really cool scene. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my first scene, scene number one. I love that. Yeah, like, like he, I love everything that you said about mentorship, and I love, like, he encouraged him, right? Like, he put courage into Alex because Alex was there, yeah. and he said, I, I saw this whole list. I'm the dumbest person on this list. And Reed had yep. to check him, and he was like, hold on. Um, I don't know if you realize, but none of the other people on this list have, like, been off the planet, you know what I mean, and, like, doing all this other yeah. stuff, like – and he was like, oh, yeah, he said, that's experience. You know what I mean? Like, like that's something that they need that you can give yeah. them experience and perspective. And I, and like Alex, he, he perked up. He was like, OK, like I like I, I have a purpose here. Like, I'm not just here to be last in line of, you know, whatever, you know, all of these, you know, brilliant minds that you're bringing together. Like, I, mm -hmm. I'm an I'm an equal. I've got something to offer. And exactly, man, I'm so glad he did that because, man, Alex's role later on, like you see Alex grow. Alex grows through this and it's so dope to see like where he ends up later. You know what I mean? And I don't want to make it like it's some earth shattering thing. But this very moment from right here to like when this whole book really like this whole thing really gets like off the rocker, like Alex steps up, you know, in like a dope way and you see him grow and it's just like. You think back, you, these are the moments that we can think back to, you know, like when we do the last one, like we might have to do the last volume and then come back and do a whole conclusion, like conversation about like all of them as a whole, because there's going to be so many things that we point back to that we liked about what happened later. They're going to be like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, and then that, and then that. So this is this, but this will definitely be one of the ones I talk about. Thanks, Zach. That was a really, really, really good share. Um, I'm going to go next Yeah, uh, on mine. So mine was actually it it deals it deals with this and let me see it's actually it's, I thought it was at the end of this one. Let's see. Yeah, I'll 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 find it, but essentially it was the part where they were talking about the Future Foundation, and um well you know they they brought Ben in and they were like. You know, hey, Ben, we found, you know, the kids decided what they want to do <clears throat> with like their first uh, what they want to make their first project within the Future Foundation. And he was like, oh, I yeah, think that's the end that? of the second issue into the second. OK, thanks, Swin. I think it's and, the end of this. I think that, so. Yeah, that sound that sounds right. And he was like, they want to they want to make it you. And he was like, what? And they were like, yeah, they found a way to, like, cure you. You know, it's not permanent, but it's but it's temporary. And at first, Ben is like, I don't want nothing to do with this, you know, because this is something that he deals with all the time. And 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 Reed has to talk to him, and he's like, no. And then Valeria starts talking to him, and you know, Reed can bat off. I mean, Ben can bat off Reed because that's just his brother. Like, you know, that like he can be a little callous with him, but he couldn't be with his. You know, effectively his niece, right? So she starts breaking it down and talking to him, and they were then they start breaking it down to him, and they're like, you know, yeah, it's not permanent, but we, you pretty much can be, you know, like human for, you know, one week out of the year, 
and he's just like, I'll take it. And she and she's like, I'm sorry we couldn't do more, Uncle Ben, than that. But he's like, I, I'm 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 down, and he took it. And th- and it's that one right there where mm-hmm. he accepts it, and then and then once he accepts it, like Reed jumps on his back and is like, basically prepping him, like, okay, hey, give it, you know, go ahead and give it to him. He's been waiting so long for this, and the look on Ben's face right there. As as they're holding it out to him and saying, you know, congratulations, Mr. Gr- Grimm, you get to be human again. Like, look at the look on Ben's face that like this was like a strong character moment part for me all the way through from him fighting it. And, and like in it being such a sore subject that he doesn't even want to hear about it to him, like finally, like breaking down and listening to it. And the second that he gets some assurance about it, he's like, I don't care if it's just for a week, like I'll take it. You know what I mean? And I just thought that was awesome. But not only that, it's all like to, to add some some more impact on it. It was who within the Future Foundation that picked it. If you look at this picture, the one where Reed's in the bottom right corner and in the top left corner, or actually uh, pick all, all the bottom on the left side, when they're talking about like what all the kids wanted to do. And I think another thing that's kind of funny, this is a humor part. Uh, they're talking about what all the kids uh, wanted to do instead, and the um, the kid that they took from the mastermind guy, like uh, uh-huh. the one that, that Reed rescued. You know, he's like brainwashed yeah. to be evil, so he was like, you know, uh, I wanted to build a, a death ray, <laughs> and, then, and, and Ben was like, shocking. I just thought that was really funny because <laughs> he's this innocent little kid. But he came from the mastermind guy, so he's like brainwashed to be evil. <laughs> so everybody's talking about all these cool like kid things that they would do with it, and he's like, "I wanted." He's standing there with, like pouting, like I wanted to build a death ray. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious, and Ben's all like shocking. But Valeria, she says, "But it was the Moloids who decided our first project should be you, and Ben saved the Moloid kids." In the last one. So the fact that it mm-hmm. was them, and then right when she says that, you go to the next panel, and it's them cheering, and they're like, uh, Hail Grim, Savior of the Universe. And I just thought that was so <laughs> precious, man. I just loved it so much that they that Hickman's already just taken little things from stuff that he just did, impactful moments, a moment that we spent a lot of time talking about, Ben Grimm being the heart of the team, him like sacrificing everything and risking it all to bring those kids to safety. And the second that those kids could pay it back out of nowhere, Reed Richards decides I'm ditching the old fogies. We're going with youth to think about the future kids who don't think with limitations or think with a lot less. The second that they, that the Moloid kids get to pay it back, they pick Ben Grimm to be the first project and they help him be human for a little while. And I just thought that was awesome. So that was my, that was my touching moment. Oh right. yeah, I, I I love this scene. I I'm a I'm a big fan of of the thing, and I I, I love this scene a lot too. I I particularly love like when it starts out and reads like, yeah, they've we've got a way to cure you. I like how how Ben's first reaction is, look, I don't have time for this. Yep. I've been through this before. I've been cured. It never works. But then like as Reed and Valeria start to explain it. I like watching him come around more to the idea right. uh, because this is a guy. Yeah, he's he's been through it. He's he's faced being cured before. He's had that hope and then seen it dashed, and he always ends up being the thing again. So yeah, this was an awesome scene. Yeah, it was awesome. All right, Ash, and we're gonna go to you, my friend. What is your first impactful moment or memorable moment from? This trade. All right. It's no fair because you guys get to pick all the good moments before me. So I just wanna <laughs> I just wanna throw that out there. You do to, it. To, to just a, next week I petition that Ash be the first to so go. So that I can just slip off that blame. No. I'm I am i am to, I'm totally down for that. <laughs> it's okay, it's fine. Um this this book was very much harder for me than the last volume because the last volume really had these big impact moments. this volume feels more like the sum of the parts rather than for me at least. And so it's harder to nail down like, Oh my gosh, this, although the, the scenes you guys pointed out, I mean, they're, I absolutely agree with, with each, each of those books, um, as book one and two, mm-hmm. um, had the, probably the most 
impactful moments of those issues. So I'm going to skip to book three okay. before you guys get there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, page sixty of the of the uh, of the complete collection is um, it opens up with we get introduced to uh, the greatest. Am I on page? Ah, uh, yes. No, because I'm not in the complete collection. I'm on the trade, so I'm going to find that oh. one where you guys are. Well, it should be be close because we're in the first volume, so the page count should be similar. Already, but I know who you, I know I know who you're talking about though. Already, um, it is. Uh, I think it's right before that page where you're at. It is. Yep, I wasn't far. Okay. So um, we get opened up here. On, oh, yours is, your page breaks are different. So on the right hand side, um, that's weird. Yeah, I think it's just. You don't have. Kindle, I think it's Kindle app being Kindle app. I'll refresh it, but you continue. Yeah, because this should be two pages. Anyways, starting on the right hand side, where it says State University years ago, um, we get a flashback scene, and we got a professor, um, you know, teaching a class, you know. Uh, and what does he say that it is? Uh, it's Moral Philosophy Ethics 201. Mm -hmm. um, what an interesting class. And he asks a question like, uh, what is right? And are there any brave souls out there who wish to venture an answer? To which we see a young man posit uh, an answer. And he says, what is right, sir, is an action that serves the best interest within someone's sphere of influence, starting with being true to oneself and progressively expanding outward, sequentially asking, is this the best for my family? Then is it best for my friends? Then for my community? Until arriving, is this best for all mankind? And the professor says, ah, excellent. Mr. Richards, so now we discover, that's Reed Richards, offers us an extrapolation of the, tr uh, of the true is the whole. Um, and then he's, you know, goes on paraphrasing, Heigl, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, he, he hears acceptable but inferior and we see another man uh, arrogant standing up in his suit and he says it is a flawed philosophy dependent on the assumption that all individuals merit equality it's foolishness really the only right action is the one that promotes survival evolution ascendance that is a surprising position this day and age Mr. Von Doom and so I just this scene was such a perfect way in my mind to introduce doom um in, in in this a flashback i like how you don't necessarily know that it's reed or doom at first because it's just they don't look like who we're you know used to and i am a massive lover like dr doom is my favorite uh marvel character and it's a hit or miss scenario for me because because he's my favorite character i have high demands for him and if you don't write him very well or even if you write a mediocre i'm like i want nothing to do with the like get this faulty doom out of my you know like um and so i i get i get a little nervous sometimes when i see like oh i'm gonna feature doom in this and i'm like oh yeah but if they do it wrong it's just gonna be worse than not doing it at all um but hickman has thus far delivered doom almost like perfectly I, I i can't imagine doing better and one of the things i love is number one he captures the arrogance of doom which is easiest to do i think most writers capture the arrogance but number two is why he's arrogant he's not arrogant because he just is overabundant in pride he's that damn he good. is that good <laughs> <laughs> right yeah and when you and when you are that good I believe a character like Dr. Doom, it seems to be the most probable type of character. It's difficult for me to see someone like Reed Richards be so utterly amazing and just advanced beyond normal human comprehension and yet not be arrogant, which is why I really liked floating back to the first volume when he has that conversation with Sue and she's like asking something of him and he says to her like, look, when I was 12, I did this. When I did, you know, 
I made I split my first atom at fifteen. Like he was going off, and he's like, "I will not." And he he basically like puts his foot down, and I was like, "Oh, here's the, this is like what I would expect more of a Reed Richards." And I really like that Hickman did that, had some foresight. But Doom, of course, doesn't have the ethics of Reed, and so takes it to a more singular uh, survival of the fittest type mentality. And I like though how we get the first kind of adversarial positioning where reed responds um actually professor it's arrogant what is it? it's arrogant and the answer of an aristocrat so it's not surprising at all you think you're better than everyone don't you victor to which victor responds in here absolutely and it's just again so perfect victor von doom and you know they don't hate each other at this point they're just rivals in school but He's never met his match. Like Victor Von Doom literally in his mind walks on water. Like mm-hmm. he he's above all things. And he'll get to know that Reed is his equal and possibly his superior in many ways. But um uh at this point, it's just a really great way of introducing the character. It's very subtle. And in, in some of these moments, they don't may not seem much on the surface. I think again, this is a sum of its parts when you read the whole book the scene stands out more. So I'm really not capturing it well, but um, I, I just believe that uh, with all the sort of hinting that all hope lies in doom and that the, this, this overall <laughs> Hickman fantastic four arc is going to heavily lean on the importance of doom that this scene seems really crucial to me. And I think, um, I think it was just nailed. I can't imagine it being done in a better way. And uh, in this issue itself, they have to actually turn to Doom for help immediately. So uh, we kind of see like when it's like, oh, what can we do? And it's like, I think I know someone who could help us. And they they go to Doom because he's that good. He's that damn good. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And he knows it. And he knows it, and he flaunts it. Um, I, 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 you know, obviously, we're not giving away spoilers. As uh, I mean, all like Ash, Ash, and Ash and uh, and Zach both have some some gaps as far as going all the way up and where it concludes in Secret War. So we're not going to give too much away. But to everything that Ash just said, and why I keep saying all hope lies in doom as it's a reoccurring theme through here. I think it was very apparent that Hickman got it in his mind quite early. The whole adage of the hero is only as good as their villain. And he leaned into that really hard, really fast, really firmly with a lot of weight out the gate. And I mean, it don't take a rock rocket scientist to know um, how amazing doom is. But it does take a a person at a certain level of the craft to execute how brilliant and how much of a, you know, of an of an oppressive, oppressive, magnanimous dynamo Victor Von Doom is. And yeah, Hickman put stock in that bank real early. (laughs) <laughs> like it's weird like doom is almost more important <laughs> to all of this than everybody else <laughs> like he's so damn important it's funny. right <laughs> yeah i mean in, it, in this it, even like it, pays dividends a, almost immediately in this issue yeah and this is how doom works for me too like they've tried in the past to give doom his own series multiple times they've done different things and when he's just like the main guy and the camera is really focused on him the whole time, it loses something. It does. I like does. seeing Doom here wander in as sort of a guest star in the Fantastic Four and sort of like shining above them. Like what you said, I'd be a great villain. You know, ultimately, Doom has to fail whatever ultimate measure because he is the bad guy and, and the, the heroes will thwart him but the the fact that that hickman creates a, an adversary that's like how can you stop this guy like it's he's better than everybody like that makes it so much more interesting rather than some someone who's inferior and you go oh yeah of course they beat him he's just 
you know, he's a sissy pants. Than him. It's like, yeah, like, <laughs> like, yeah, like it. Um, but I, I, I love, I like the fact that it almost feels like this is Doom's book because that's like Doom's character. Wherever he shows up, he like steals the show. He's like, yeah, this is my comic book. Now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, that's that's what Doom would do. You know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Still scenes, still whole damn comics. And yeah, this whole this whole this whole series, yeah, where it ends up going. Oh my gosh. But anyway, um, well, on to number two. And uh I'm actually gonna jump in on number two myself. So Go for it, twin. Yeah, let's 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 give it a go. Okay, so my moment for uh, my uh, remarkable moment is we're gonna go back to page twenty two. Uh, in the trade paperback, the not um, super duper complete extra ultra deluxe uh, version of <laughs> of this volume. Um, to me, it was uh, I it really stood out. It was in issue number one. It's at the end of the issue. Um, it's Reed going to the uh, metahuman psycho- psycho- psychiatry facility uh, or psychiatric facility, and he's going and he's checking up on um, on the mastermind guy. And I I don't know what his I can't think of. I what forget his name real is. name. I know he's the wizard, but I the always wizard. forget his real name. Yeah. yeah, they 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 say it in here because he's he's, he's something he's Bentley. Yes, Bentley. Oh, yeah, something Bentley. The West Bentley. It might be West Bentley. Um, but yeah, he's the wizard, and he is up in there. He's um, being, you know, kind of uh, erratic, and they they think he pretty much lost his marbles. Um, and as the guy who's talking to Reed is letting him know, like, hey, he's not really he's not really understanding what you're saying. You know, he's speaking of kind of like almost like revelation, like in times, you know, coming and stuff like that. It hurts Reed to see him like that, because what Reed, even though he's unethical, what Reed appreciates about him is the thing that Reed possesses the most of himself. And that's an intel intelligence, mm-hmm. smarts, you know, um, just all of those you know, high, you know, h- high logic and scientific like functionalities and stuff like that that the wizard possesses. And as he's up there and kind of kind of going wild, Reed turns and he tells the guy like, hey, give him give him this. And he's and the guy's like, hold, hold on, wait, like you're trying to give him stuff. And he's like, don't worry, I've I've stripped all, you know, like any kind of technology out of it. It's basically hollow. It's empty. But just give it to him. And the dude took the box in and he and he gave it to him. And the wizard pulls it out, and he and it's his helmet. He put it on, and it's his wizard helmet. And the second that he puts it on, he is completely, like, lucid. Like, he is right there, back in the moment. He's basically back to himself. You know, it's like going home again. He, he puts his helmet on, and he felt comfortable. All is right in the world. And now he starts talking to Reed, you know, coherently. And now they can have more of a, a conversation that, you know, it's transactional because the way that he was speaking at that point, I like the wizard was still tapped in to what ultimately was going to be going on. That's what like Reed doesn't understand. He wasn't he, he wasn't speaking in a rational way, but what, but he was speaking the truth. That's what Reed didn't understand. But when he put the helmet on now, he can speak to Reed in a way that Reed could understand. And he basically is telling him like, hey, everything's going to burn like everything that you're trying is in vain, you know, like. You know, I am what I am. You are what you are. It's pointless to try to change things. This is it. And and basically, Reed had a, you know, Reed is just like not accepting what he's saying even then. Like, you know, he's speaking more coherently, but he's not accepting the fact, you know, the fact of what the wizard is telling him. And Reed basically tells him like, hey, I'm sorry, Bentley. Like, I really wanted to help you. And, you know, we still are going to fix you. But the way that I'm going to fix you is through your son. He's I, I adopted him. He's staying with me and my family in the Baxter building. And that's the way that I am going to fix you. Since he's a clone of you, I'm going to fix you through him because he's the future. And then, and then that's when you go into the, uh, the you know, the, um, him being a part of the Future Foundation as well. Bentley Whitman. Thank you so much for that, Ash. Ash, Ash uh, on comics, the, uh, or Mr. AOC. Actually, it's still AOC because you need to be Ash on chat because you're in the chat, man. Holding it down, I appreciate you. Um, what did you guys think about this scene? Yeah, I liked it. I'm, I'm, I'm confused about the whole cloning thing. Um, in the sense, not 
I, I, I'm struggling with understanding how that fixes him. So, um, so it, it really, do, it really doesn't fix him. But I think what he was trying to say is, you know, uh, like once you see, like, one of two things either. It, I, I, along the along the terms of what he was saying at the beginning of the first issue, how like all the old people basically they're dinosaurs, they're not thinking, you know, forward enough, fast enough, you know, and that why he went with the kids. It's like the the, the children are the future. So basically, like either like you're a has been, like you're, like your your son is the future. The, the the young clone that you made of yourself is the future. So I'm going to fix the future you, and I think how it can double is if the wizard sees what his son becomes with Reed's tutelage and mentorship to go back to what Zach was talking about earlier, then that may inspire the wizard to do better and to maybe, you know, like start straightening himself, his self out while he's in there, you know, maybe with the hopes of, you know, being psychologically well, quote unquote, and then reuniting with his son after he gets out of there with his clone after he gets out. So I think it works in, in both of those ways. Hmm. Yeah, Hickman really um, makes me scratch my head about some of the morals and ethics of Reed Richards, uh, and and I'm 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 reserving judgment because I know this is a longer, bigger picture story, um, so I don't want to jump the gun. But this is why I kind of I picked a well, actually, was gonna pick that. I haven't given that scene yet, so I'll I'll go I'll cover that scene in. Uh, well, actually, no. I, 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 the, the the scene that I picked out did have an example of that too, where he answers what is right. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, you can, you I, can I go felt... for it because you're you're going you're going next, so go for it. Okay, so well, just continue. So on on answering what was right, mm -hmm. I felt like his answer was very uh, selfish. Like I didn't Re Reed's answer. I, Reed's answer, yeah, because it started with the self. It started with, and then it branched out, and I felt like, I think that's a natural, secular understanding of what is right. Because well, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and and I'm not saying necessarily that it it it's out of character for Reed or anything like that, but okay, as a, as a reader, I'm questioning like, is that really what's right though? I mean, everyone would just say what's for themselves. And and that's kind of the problem. If if what's right is what everyone deems is for themselves, how is that actually right? If you you know everyone is basically everyone look out for themselves. If said thing can also benefit your family, okay, then so be it. And if that said thing can also benefit your community outside of that, and then so be that. And if it can help mankind, like then great. But. I almost feel like that what's right would be in reverse order. Um, and Doom, of course, doesn't give a better answer per se, but he gives a more understandable answer from his perspective because he's not trying to pretend to be a noble, you know, uh, virtuistic character uh, as Reed is. So that's why I say I question with Reed because is is how much of a hero anyways I'm, I'm kind of uh getting in the weeds on that so my my other scene i'm gonna go back to the first issue mm -hmm. uh, it's like right in the beginning of the first volume mm -hmm. it opens up at this symposium yes. uh in golden colorado and it kind of mm -hmm. leads into the scene that zach did which is why um i didn't i didn't i didn't cover this so but uh, before that scene, um, it's called Singularity 2010, which apparently Singularity <laughs> seems to be Hickman's favorite thing. Yeah, dude, that, and that's what I was saying about when you start reading through his work, you see reoccurring themes. You see what, like, his interests and his affinities are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's basically, uh, it's not really a TED Talks, but it's, a, it's basically a meeting of the minds um where all the smartest people in the world gather and talk and he's kind of giving an uh you know an introduction and now one thing that did throw me here is why jennifer walters is here and then he gives her this big rec recognition that her her keynote <laughs> which is called the the impending legal and moral dilemmas of genetic engineering synthetically created humanity 
prosperity or person question mark displayed the exact kind of insight this conference has been built on i'm like okay i'm I'm glad jennifer walters made a guest appearance cameo but is she really among the like the brightest minds of the planet like well keep in mind this is marvel comics she hulk not mcu she hulk <laughs> so no but i i don't I, I don't think that much like alex said you know like look i don't you guys are the smartest people on the planet i don't belong here that was a cool scene because that made a lot of sense, even though that guy was a person who got a perfect SAT scores. He is probably one of the smartest people on the planet. Yeah, but um, hers is dealing, is, is dealing with laws, though, and like l like legalities and morality of that. Yes, but it's but, not really. She's not like an expert on like the subject that she's that she's talking about. The morality is and the legalities around. She is an expert at law, so that that it makes perfect sense. Well, but she's not even like the best lawyer. Right? I mean, she she's don't, not she even don't, like she the best, but she don't got to be the best lawyer to understand law and then be able to speak. I'm to not it. saying that. I'm just, but we're at the symposium of like the super geniuses, and her expertise. She's not even the best in her area of expertise, so it just seemed out of place. But I don't want to beleaguer that point. I just wanted to say for my own benefit or whatever. Like that threw me off. Didn't ruin the book. Thought it was a little weird. That's all. <laughs> Moving on. Um, the part though that I really liked is, and this is a lot of like word, it's not word salad, but it's a wall of text. Mm -hmm. um, the, the words do really matter. And that's why this scene uh, uh, mattered to me, but it's probably going to be boring to anyone who's just like looking at a page and doesn't have the greater context. Um, but basically Reed is talking to people and he says, I've spent a weekend walking around in a daze, wondering what has happened to the great men and women that helped define the legacy of this place. And then last night, I figured it out. You've grown old. Now, before this, he kind of shocks. I kind of skipped up ahead of that. Um, he talks about, he, after he praises Jennifer Walters, he says, unfortunately, the same cannot be the said for the rest of you. And he, he basically dunks on a couple of um, big minds, Dr. Chang and some guy named Thomas. And he's like, oh, your politics masquerading as practicality. And the other one is like, truly disappointing. Uh, so this basically felt like what Zach was talking about, like the writing Elon Musk. Reed here very much feels like the Elon Musk we've seen in recent years. The, the, the Elon that's standing up to the establishment. The Elon that's like, we need to get to Mars. Like, we need to stop worrying, you know, pussyfooting around with, you know, people being offended by words that, you know, upset them and, <laughs> and things like that. Like, we have he's like a bigger picture kind of guy and i don't even think elon's the smartest guy on the planet i think he's a big brain guy for sure um i think elon is a person who is smart in a lot of areas rather than being super smart in like one particular and that's what a enables him to now work with other super highly intelligent people to get things like making ships go to mars um Reed here being this kind of guy who's like talking like an actual intelligent person who cause it was able to see bigger picture issues. And many times I've seen Reed just like, Oh, I can invent anything. That's how we write him smart. You know, how smart is Reed? Well, let's write him inventing a time machine or like making something that no one could ever do except Reed Richards. And therefore he's smart because the writers themselves, and I don't mean to demean anyone, this is a very difficult thing to write Reed Richards. He's smarter than anyone in the real world. So, like, he's definitely smarter than the writer. It's a difficult thing to do. But Hickman brings him to a level because Hickman is probably one of the smart, smartest writers in comics. Mm -hmm. Maybe ever. Like, you know, like, he's he's one of those rare, bigger brain people that's writing comics. And I he's got a grasp for things. And it's and it's here that it's not where he's showing it off by having Reed explain something extremely complex, scientific, to to show off how much the writer knows. What what he impresses me here is that he the personality that he puts into Reed, the ability to write a character 
and understand like what their perception is when they are the smartest person in the room. I truly believe that you have to be in that position to understand. And I, I'm sure Hickman in many times in his circles has been the smartest man in the room. Right. I, I go back and I think about the X slack thing, you know, like, and I'm sure like his time dealing with that group. And I'm like, <laughs> he, he, that's must be what it feels like. And so Reed is kind of frustrated here and he pushes on and he's like, um, what does he say? Uh, despite all this evidence presented here suggests that the most of you have never been more pessimistic for our future. You fear tomorrow. Throughout the day, the shock of this mindset has turned to disappointment and finally now to anger. And he's this is like this is written in 2010 before like crazy woke culture, before all mm -hmm. these things that are like so commonplace today. Mm -hmm. and he's like specifically because of people like you, Dr. Clark. Um one billion, a quote, one billion, the optimum population of humanity, close quote, is the narrow vision of a dying man. Preserve everything. Do whatever it takes to hang on a little longer. It's the speech of a coward, Douglas. The future of man is not one billion of us fighting over the limited resources of a soon-to-be-dead planet, but one trillion human beings spanning an entire galaxy, the future of man is not here. It's out there. And it's because, because it's our new horizon, because of it's what's next. Standing here today, I'm faced with the questions. Do I want to be Magellan? Do I want to be Columbus or Cousteau or Armstrong? Or do I want to be you? There comes a time when each generation has outlived its usefulness and must be cast aside for a new one. And it's with this understanding that I resign from this body immediately. Um, because there is a fire called discovery burning within me and I won't go back in the cave for anyone. And then we cut to the scene that Zach gave, which is a great scene. And it, I just, I know it's not a super impactful moment, but I, I can't emphasize <laughs> how much sometimes capturing a character is so important for a story. Um, just like how doom was captured so well for me in a really simplistic way. Reed Richards here just giving a speech to basically giving a TED talk type thing and shocking the whole intellectual community. This is what the smartest man on the planet thinks of the world. And now he's a nice guy. So he's, but yeah, I, I just, when you're the smartest man in the room, it is very difficult to dumb yourself down and just accept. And if you ever, and if you, if you, I hate to say this, I'm not trying to be arrogant or jerky, but if you don't understand that, it's probably because you haven't been the smartest man in the room. Um anyways, that this that's what this scene meant to me. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely um kind of going back to what Zach was talking about earlier, this this is Reed, you know, being a dick. Like th this is yeah. this is the I like I have far more interest and I and I have far more investment and I have far more value intelligence, technology and progress than I do your emotions and maintaining our relationships. If our relationship doesn't equal to what I feel like is the most optimal like option like for this, then our relationship is only going to last as long as, as, as I find you useful or we find each other useful to get towards my ultimate goal. And he's not trying to be, he's not trying to be mean, but right. that, but, but that's, mm -hmm. this is within his personality to just care for and foster and steward this type of progress as opposed to, you know, uh, the opposite. Um, yeah. It's when you got anything to add to that. Yeah, no, I mean, this definitely, I mean, and it tracks like modern Reed Richards, uh, I mean, shoot, I think even you could probably even go back to the Jack Kirby, like original Reed Richards. It is kind of, you know, Reed's a good guy. He's not trying to be a bully just for the sake of being a bully. But yeah, there is kind of that. It's almost like a side effect of this increased intelligence. It's like he knows he's the smartest one in the room. And yeah, that means that he's going to be brash sometimes. He's not going to, you know, 
take feeling he's not going to coddle people he's not going to like oh you know let me give you this participation trophy let me coddle you make you feel better this actually i was reading through this and it actually reminded me there was another fantastic four run it was the marvel knights run it was uh i think it was like 40 issues uh that was written back when like reed and sue and them lost the baxter building totally different run doesn't have anything to do with this but there's like a little story where reed is like borderline bragging about how he's been called the world's smartest man and he's not doing it you know necessarily to to make this other guy feel bad it's just no this is actually a fact this is how it is this is how i think this is how i see the situation you know and then you build from there so yeah i like seeing that you know kind of that same attitude kind of going across different writers i like it's continuity i like seeing continuity in action so yeah and then what you were saying, like it is pretty much Jonathan Hickman predicting how Elon would talk to people, <laughs> you know, tw- tw- what about 20 years or so in the future, 15, 20 years in the future. Mm-hmm. So that, that is, that is really fun. It's almost like he pulled a Simpsons. Yeah. What, what got me was I, 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 when I read this, I don't feel like he was predicting anything. I think Elon was or not Elon, sorry. Hickman was writing the way we all kind of not all of us but just the scientific community just the writing in a time where you weren't having to watch what you say mm-hmm. right where where political consensus dictates like oh you can't really talk about those things because it's politically incorrect now but it's like yeah but it's science right. like we, why can't we science is all about questioning if if you can't question the science it's not science like that's the whole point of it. And and this was a time where you could talk like that and freely. And so I think what we're seeing with like Elon is just it's just a natural thing. He's not it wasn't a prediction. This is just how the past 12 years like Elon just hasn't changed. Like he's thought this way the whole time. Mm-hmm. Other people have moved because they become afraid to speak against common narratives, to be politically incorrect, you know, have their you know, if they have, if, if you are in a scientific community, you got to watch out because you re, re your grants get revoked or whatever different things. It was really changing on how we approach a lot of things. And but I liked in this scene how Reed kind of addresses that. He's talking about how they become cowards, and they just want to be like, oh, let's let's reduce the population down to a billion people. That's the optimum, like, and and hold out. And it's like that's not what smart people should be thinking of like let's just cling on to the last vestige like let's advance like you know and like that's what elon's doing like let's not just sit on this rock and worry about overpopulation we have this planet right next door called mars and i can get us there like let's let's go (laughs) you know his when you listen to him talk it's like so optimistic and it's crazy because i've been following him for several years now and i used to just totally dismiss him like I was like, dude, you will never get a privatized uh, uh, space program. Like, maybe you can send a rocket up and put a small satellite up, but the, the, for one company to do what NASA does, no way. Like, you need a government. And now, look at like SpaceX is making NASA look stupid. Like the things that they're doing. I don't know. A lot of people don't really follow this because it's really like nerdy nerd stuff. But when I saw Elon land a rocket, like old school, like 1940s type of like where rockets would like land on their tail and like the landing gear would pop out. And you're just like, dude, that's just that could only happen in like the stupidity of the 40s. Like if you're going to land, it's going to be more like a space shuttle, right? You get use the atmosphere and wings and glide down. When he has like a vertical rocket that can just come back on its butt and land and land, I, there's no way. And to do it on a small, like 30 by 30 foot platform floating in an ocean. I, and I watched him do, I was like, oh my. Like the things that, that he's doing that most people aren't paying attention to because it's just, like I said, super nerdy stuff. And most people are got other things on their mind and no big deal. It's like, NASA isn't even close. NASA can't even get astronauts into space anymore. That's how far we've like fallen behind, you know, and, and Elon's making ships that are going to be able to 
reuse like 90% of their materials or more to get up and back down from the planet. And just, it's, I could do a whole episode on Elon Musk. But anyways, the stuff that he's doing, and it's like Reed Richards has that similar mind, like, because that's how real geniuses think. That's what I'm trying to say. Real geniuses don't think, and 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 uh, Hickman is smart enough to understand this, and he illustrates it in this way, and it just spoke to me. Sorry, I'm going in the weeds again. Absolutely, yeah, no worries. All right, twin, it is on you now. Impactful moment All or right. memorable moment number two. Number two, I'm gonna. We've been talking a little bit about about Reed, and we talked a little bit about Ben. I'm gonna take it. I want to bring our attention to uh, to a, a member of the team that we haven't talked about yet tonight. That is Mr. Johnny Storm. Ah, uh, yes. A little bit of Franklin Richards in here, too. So you probably already know where I'm going with this, Skip. Uh, we're going into the second issue here in this little collection. Um, you know, little little backstory here. So Reed promised Franklin that he was going to take Franklin to this toy store. They were going to have like a father son day. But now Reed, of course, he's got sidetracked. He's building this whole future foundation, you know, this think tank. And Valeria actually gets to be a part of it, being the super genius kid that she is. And Franklin doesn't get to. He he's not quite on the same intellect level. So he's kind of getting left out. He doesn't and his dad doesn't get to go to the store and hang out with them. So Reed's, you know, and Reed's Reed, God, dude, I love you, but really, I mean, you just went through this whole thing with your wife in the first story arc, you know, about giving attention to your family. Now you, okay, that's separate. So he's like, Yeah, you know, you're you and uh and his friend Leech, the, yes, Leech. the mutant Leech from the X Men. Yeah. Um you know, they're going to go to the toy store and they're going with Johnny. And um, and Johnny, you know, kind of picks up these vibes that Franklin has. He's like, hang on. I get this. I see what's going on. You're bummed that it's me going with you and not your dad. Right. And you're bummed that maybe your dad's spending more time with Valeria than with you. You know, he's like, yeah, uh huh. Well, he's like, hey, listen, I get that. You know, my dad used to spend more time with Susan. Didn't mean he didn't love me any less or that he did love me any less. It's just he loved me differently. You know, and so Johnny, you know, he Johnny really shines here. I guess pun kind of intended as the human torch. He, he does this kind of like, you know, this uncle figure try because he knows, you know, he's like he's been there, you know, and he's trying to to show Franklin the bright side of things. So he's like, listen, you and me, we're troublemakers. We're the same kind of guy. We're square pegs for round holes. We cause ruckus. We do all this. So, you know, he, it's, it's really funny. He's taking these two kids to the toy store and he's like, what kind of toys are you going to get? And they're like, Spider-Man web shooters or Iron Man repulsors. And Franklin's like, I'm never going to, y'all are dumb. I'm the human torch. Y'all don't want to, you don't want to flame on? No? Okay, fine. Whatever. Be like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, the whole – this whole little side story, I love that. He just – it reminds me of uh, of Chris Pratt because uh, his son – there was, like, one picture where his son really wanted to be Captain America for Halloween, and he plays Star-Lord. Right. And it's like you never see – you never hear about Chris Pratt, his son wanting to be him. Like the superhero he plays, he wants to be someone else. That's what that reminded me of. So I thought that was funny. But um, yeah, there's this toy store that they go to. And I won't go scene for scene. I'll just kind of cover it generally. You find out that uh, the Impossible Man, who's never really been one of my favorite characters. He always seemed a, a little bit too like too much like Mr. Mitzelplick. Like right. he can just make anything happen. But, you know, you find out that he and Arcade, the, the murder villain Arcade, have kind of like, you know, they've come up with this toy line, this toy deal. And, of course, Arcade's the bad guy, so he's going to betray Impossible Man. And there's going to be like this. Like I said, this is one of those quote-unquote filler issues where it's like, okay, Franklin and Johnny saved the day from Arcade. But it's it, I just love it because it's Johnny, you know – and yeah, of course he's gonna do right by Franklin. He's his uncle, but I just I love those types of stories where it's like, okay, he's gonna you know step in Franklin, and Franklin's not you know useless, you know. I mean, he's 
this guy bends realities and creates realities. So it's not necessarily that he needs a protector, but, but, but I, I just love these stories where it's like, okay, you've got, you know, this person in a, in a threat that, or they're in a spot where they need help. And there's a family member there that kind of steps in, helps them out, saves the day with them. I, I just love that stuff. And, uh, and yeah, with the human torch too, because he's like, he's the least paternal of the fantastic four. You know, I mean, Reed and Sue, obviously, their parents. Uh, even Ben, he seems like he's got, you know, he's he's gruffer, but he's also he's more experienced. I think he's older than Reed, so he's almost got like this almost like older uncle, maybe grandfather-ish mentality in some ways. But Johnny's like he's the rebel, right? He's the James Dean, like he's the cool kid. He's not a paternal figure at all. He's, he's probably the one that you least want hanging out with your kid most of the time. You probably pick up bad habits from him. So I like this because it does kind of continue uh, from last week. We even talked about that scene where he recognized that he left that gate to the negative zone open. And so now he's like – and he had that whole talk with Reed about growing up and you know maturing. And so now we see some of that start to – some of those leaves are starting to bloom on this new mature side of Johnny Storm. So I, I really, really enjoyed seeing that and reading that. Yeah, man. You, th- do, you think, do, you think um, when, when Reed ca- came to Johnny and was like, hey, I'm stuck in this thing. Like, could you build me? Yo, you think you think Johnny thought twice? Johnny thought back to that conversation and he's like – this is my opportunity to grow. I got your bro in law. No problem at all. I take the kids. You go use your big brain and I, and I'll take Franklin and leech. No problem. Uh, only one thing, bro in law. I'm going to need your credit card. <laughs> right. I'm going to need that, that, that shiny Willy Wonka golden ticket credit card. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is part of him growing and, bo- and bonding, you know, so absolutely. Do, do you think, though, that that uh, Johnny knows that Franklin's got his powers? No, no one's supposed to. No one's supposed to know. No I one sh- no one should know right now. Nobody is supposed. To. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, think, nobody I don't think should. Yeah, I, I I think that it, I mean, if anyone does, I don't think it's Johnny. But uh, well, well, you but, yeah, when you no, were I, I don't a recap, think so. you were like, you know, hey, is, that you said something about how like Franklin's okay, like he's got reality oh. like. You wouldn't think that because yeah. you don't know. Like, he should be helpless. I mean, but even should if he be, did yeah. have his powers, I mean, you know, like, yeah, like, if, if you if you get... Well, actually, hold on, wait. No, because he... Didn't he use them? I think he used He his does. He does that. use... He does yeah, he use his powers. powers. Now, no, now, nobody sees him use it. It's that's actually true. really cleverly done. Yeah, so that's true. Leech gets yeah, knocked. <laughs> Leech gets gets knocked out by arcade, yeah. and uh, and Franklin gets really ticked off. He's like, "That wasn't very nice, Mister Arcade." <laughs> and so what happens is this giant stuffed dinosaur comes up behind Arcade and like picks him up in his mouth and is like chomping on him, and it gives Johnny an opening to to flame on. So, but nobody else is around in those panels to see that. Yeah, that's the one right there. I love the so, face that he's making when, he, when he's talking to Mr. Arcade. I love it. If this if this was a manga, this would be that anime panel where they just have such a dramatically pronounced face. Uh, it'd be amazing. Yeah. But like yeah. That. Uh yeah, you see there's there's nobody else around though that really sees anything. So yeah. So his secrets his powers are still secret. Yeah, uh, I would because I would think if anyone, yeah, I like, knew, I like how that, that would, was done. That would warrant like a big scene of like the Fantastic Four being like, "Uh oh, Franklin's got his powers." <laughs> we, yeah, if they went crazy. You know, yeah, I, I love the Kirby crackle right there though, too, next to his face, like as his powers are activating. Like every yes. time there's a little Kirby crackle, I'm uh-huh. always like, "Ooh, yeah. Kirby crackle right there." Ooh, you know, like I just I, I, I love. You see it like around the dinosaur head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I dig it. <laughs> It was so odd. And, and then he does a good job of covering after he like secretly gets um, arcade out the way. Then what does he do? Immediately turn to his uncle, Uncle Johnny, burn the toys. So he's basically like, Uncle Johnny, help. You know, like he has to make it look like as though 
he still is a you know rather rather helpless. But um, but anyway, now that this was a really good moment. Um, and yeah, right. I re- I really and the what's cool about this is to conclude it like after everything gets wrapped up, you know, and they're, and as they're walking out, you know, uh, you know, he, he's like, uh, you know, hey Franklin, yeah, don't think I'm not going to tell your dad just how great you were today. Thanks, Uncle Johnny. Now tell me who's your favorite superhero. What uh, what, what now tell me what what your favorite. Uh, wait, tell me, Mister. What does it say? No, tell me what your favorite superhero say. That I think that's all messed up. But anyway, they say, "Oh, what, on. what's your what?" Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, I like that because yeah, it, it mirrors the first interaction where like before they're like Spider Man, Iron Man. Now they're now they're like yeah, or you know Uncle Johnny, Human Torch. He's the best. He's the best one. Yeah. So I I really like that. That was a nice little heartwarming ending. Yeah, like Leech and him just jumping through. The, man, this like apart from like the, like how how much this plays a role later in the story. Like I just got so mm-hmm. much joy from just like living through the kids and this like this toy thing. It just it very much just felt like yeah, like some comics still from like the late eighties, early nineties. It's just episodic. They're like they go to the mall and you know they have a day out, and then in the midst of all this, like superpowers get used. You know, what I'm saying toys are burned. You know, like you know, it's just re- it's just really cool. But hey, remember, Mister Impossible, he makes the impossible possible. All righty, and I yes, guess yes, he uh, does. Yes, he I, does. So we're on to number three now, right? So Ash, why don't you go first? AOC, AOC, are you with me? I'm going to take it that AOC fell asleep. Ash, Maybe did he. You? Let's see. No, no, no chat. Might he might be frozen. Well, we'll give him some time to uh to come back to the world. Uh, I guess I will I will go in his stead. Um for myself, I am going okay. to go all the way to the end unless Ash is back. Ash, do I hear you? I do That's... not. Oh, there he is. Okay, Ash is back. There, there he, is. he is. All right, Ash, I, I was going to have I was going to have you go uh, first for uh, moment number three. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, now that you got the uh, murder world out of the way. <laughs> right. <I was> like, <laughs> Glad someone got to cover that besides me. Uh, no, I, I actually like, I liked it because it wasn't a whole issue. Mm-hmm. I don't I, Cause it was a little bit filler, but it was only a partial issue. Um, so, and it did really have that good thing moment. Um, I'm gonna say that my final. Wow, man, it's <laughs> it's tough. I think my final moment is. Oh, you know what? You should probably save me for last because it's the final moment of the book, or the final scene. Alrighty, no problemo. Um, twin, you want to give a crack at it, or do you need some time? Yo. All right, let's do it. Uh, sure. I'll I'll, I'll take a little crack at it. This one kind of it kind of builds off a little bit of a, a moment Ash actually told us about a little bit earlier. First of all, the panel you have it on, I I did enjoy this. This isn't my moment, but I did enjoy this because. I don't know a whole lot about the Maestro. I haven't read any of the Maestro's books or miniseries. But yeah. like as they're doing these flash forwards on New World, and you find out that Banner Junior or or whatever his uh his, like yeah. younger Banner, he turns into the Maestro. I was like, oh, this is where he comes from. Yes, uh, like the, it just clicked. The, it was it was awesome. The music stops and the Maestro takes the stage. <laughs> that was so. so 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 greatly written too. I love the the way that that was written. And so concise. But no, I'm gonna I'm gonna. It, it's so concise and then poetic too. Just music and maestro. Just mm. Hickman, you're you're beautiful, Hickman. You're beautiful. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm gonna fast forward. It's in that that third issue, and and it's this whole story where we're going back where 
you know, it's back in Reed's college days. And, you know, Ash talked a, a little while back. He was talking about there's that scene in the classroom where he and Doom are they're going over these different ideas. So the scene I have in mind takes place a little bit after that. Um, I'm trying to find the page number here on Comixology, but it's at the point where, you know, Reed and Ben, they, they've come across, you know, Reed's dad shows up. All that Kirby crackle on the screen is beautiful. That's the one right there. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, right there. Uh, yeah, so at this point, you know, Reed's dad has come back and uh, kind of let them know, like, he's being hunted through time. There's this, you know, this guy, this crazy guy. He's been hunting all these different variations of, of Reed's dad. And so Reed's like, well, I'm not going to lose. You. He's like, and he's he's thinking, he's like, well, I don't want to lose my dad, but I know I can't do this by myself. And I know somebody who's smart enough to help us. And so he and Ben and, and Reed's dad, uh, Nathaniel, uh, they go to Doom. And they're in his lab. And uh, and the first thing that Doom says, it's like, I want to hear you say that again. <laughs> and so, you know, and Reed's like, fine, listen, here's the whole situation, blah, 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 blah. You know, he's like, no, 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 I don't want to hear that. I want to hear the other thing. And so Reed's like, please. And so the Doom is like, oh, yeah, humility suits you, Richard. Like, Oh, the, the, it's like we talked about the arrogance of Doom and just like how he can just like belittle, like even someone as smart as Reed, like he just like belittles him, even though he's already coming to him asking for his help. He already is you know, knowing that Doom is like, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. He's like, no, you got to make yourself even smaller, you know, or, or make me even bigger. Yeah, and, like, uh, like Reed, Reed yeah. comes and humbles himself to, to 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 ask for Victor's help, and then Victor yeah. wants to humiliate. So he takes his his humility to another level. He wants to humiliate him and make him even lower. Yeah, and just and, and you know, it really and it says something too. Just Reed and Reed puts up with it because he knows like I need this guy's help if I'm going to save my dad. Uh, because Reed actually loves his dad and wants to be there and save his dad, Dan Slot. Um, by the way, <laughs> um, that's a whole separate trail. I'm not going to go down. Happy thoughts on this stream, but uh, but yeah, no, this is this is why it's just like it's just smug doom. This isn't even like this is like he's not a villain yet, but it's just like. He's like, yeah, I'll help you, but you know, say it again. Yeah, I think he even gives him a third time. He's like, say please one more time. It's mm -hmm. like this this bully, this arrogant narcissist guy. I love it. It was is just awesome to read. Yeah, no, that was uh again, you know, capturing like really capturing Victor Von Doom and driving the point home of his personality, you know. And even back then when he wasn't you know, if anybody was close to who they were, it was Victor Von Doom. But even still, he was far from his final form, even at that time. But he was still very much who he was at the core mm -hmm. of his person. Definitely love that scene. And this panel I love, too. I love this panel, too, as just an add-on to that. Because he's giving Ben – remember, Ben's not the thing yet. So he All gives right. him, like, this exoskeleton. And he's like – it should be simple enough for a, a, a simple guy like you to manage. And, you know, he's just like already you can see he's like he's our, he's he's berating and belittling Ben now because, mm -hmm. you know, he knows Ben's not as smart as Reed. So he's just going to continue to just knock him down. And okay. Ben's just like, oh, dude, I don't even care. This suit's so cool anyway. But, yeah, it's just like just this attitude of how he'll just belittle everybody just to elevate himself and like to stand a head and shoulders above everyone else. Yeah. He's doom. He's yeah. better than everyone. All hope lies in doom. All hope lies in doom. And there is always hope. Which is the thing that I have. I, that's what I put behind us. That was like the, the screen grab I did today. But you can't really read it because we've got all these awesome comics and our our mugs and, and profile pics on, on top of it. Anything to add to that one at all, Ash? Um... No, I think you guys covered the what I would. I mean, this is just more of Doom being Doom awesome again. 
Um, every doom is awesome. <laughs> every doom is. I, I every just, doom is cool when you're part character. of the team. Every doom is awesome. Okay, uh, that's what's I, up. I love. Right. I love how Hickman. I love how Hickman writes doom. Not as like evil, but yet. He's just. He. How do I say it? Like he's he's a megalomaniac. Mm -hmm. oh, he yeah. really truly sure. believes he's the only person qualified to be in charge. Mm -hmm. He's not there per se to be greedy. He's not there because he wants to cause harm to people. He, his motivations are literally like the world cannot survive without him. And he mm -hmm. has to just be in charge. That's just, it's just the logic of the matter. And he's willing because of his his morality and ethics he's willing to do dirty things to make sure that happens like he and and i just i find that makes him such a more complex character than the evil like i want to conquer the world because i'm evil like he's yeah it, I, I just love this so every aspect that he writes yeah it makes him it makes him a lot more interesting than just being evil for the sake of being right. evil it's, yeah so all hope lies in doom. Got it. All right, Ash, did you find your third part, or did you still want to go last? Hey, I have two parts. Like, okay. I mean, we can do I, that. I'm juggling. The, yeah. the the first one is after this scene mm -hmm. where they go and fight uh, Nathaniel, the mm -hmm. the other Nathaniel. Um, but I think I'm gonna choose the other one, which is in the last book. We see both Franklin Richards and, well, they kind of all bleed together. So, okay, we'll go to, uh, it's page, it's around page 89, depending on which version you have. And they're fighting the... Uh, the other Nathaniel. It's 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 there's there's a time where in the book, um, who was it? The uh, it, Im Immortus. What's his name? Immortus. Yeah. The Immortus. Other version, yeah. I think the other version of Cain. Because there's so many com. Yeah, there's so many complexities. It's like difficult to like go over what Hickman's doing because it's so much. But yeah, so I kind of get a feeling. I I'm curious. I would be curious to know like the Loki TV show when I was reading this, I was like, man, I feel like they pulled things yes. out of this book to make the Loki TV, like radically change things around. Right. Like there's no Nathaniel Richards in the Loki show. Right. But there is Loki. Yes. And in the Loki show, I'm like, they, it almost feels like they just took this story concept and this erased Nathaniel and said, we'll put Loki in instead. <laughs> and he'll be, so essentially, just like in Loki show, there's a tons of Nathaniel Richards, and they've all come to a faraway planet in the middle of nowhere in the future, <laughs> like, and and Term uh, Amortis, who runs the uh, what do you call it? The um, TVA. What's it? The TVA instead of Kang. Decides like that he's the greatest threat to this whole like his old timeline thing, <laughs> just like how Loki is the greatest threat to the whole like all the Lokis have to be purged, all the Nathaniels have to be purged. Like I was like, there's a lot of similarities here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyways, so be that as it may, all the Nathaniels end up fighting very Highlander style throughout time, um, and it gets down to there's only two, and that's where we are in this book, and. What what you described, uh, Zach, was when he comes back and sees Reed in the past, wherever, and they decide to go help him with Doom's help, and we get to the scene where they finally meet and they battle, and it's a big climactic battle or whatever, and with Doom's help, Reed has finally won, um, and uh, but but Nathaniel can't go through it. He's like, I've never killed anyone. I I, I can't do it. I'm not a murderer. Um, and Doom says but you know how this has to end and pause. 
do what you have to do, Victor. You know, do it, and then Victor just comes up and just clubs him to death. And again, it's like Doom will do what he has to do, and he's like, "Now we can leave this place." But I want you to remember, Richards. Remember what happened here. Remember who saved you. Remember who set you free. Remember Doom. Um, and I, I just. First of all, I, I just liked. I, I don't like the Nathaniel character. I, I, I'm trying to grow, like let him grow on me. But when this book started, I'm like, ah, oh, I just don't like the whole. You know, I, we talk about this all the time with legacy stuff. I just didn't like the idea that like Reed Richards is actually a legacy character. He's actually got a super genius pops. He was like, you know, I'm like, ah, oh, really? I just, I. I just so tired of that trope. It feels cliche to me. But I liked here that Hickman doesn't let Nathaniel be the victor. Essentially, they need Doom to do it. So this Nathaniel guy, it, it would have would not have worked for me if Nathaniel would have just won. No, um, and he was a pacifist anyway. He had never even yeah. killed anybody. He he right. let everybody I mean, else die off, and he he was just the last. Not one even not even about him away. doing yeah. the violence, just about he couldn't do it. Like he failed. Like I don't want Nathaniel to up, you know, like steal the thunder, if you will. Like it just, and that's what I was worried about this character. So Doom comes in, and it's like, and, and Hickman in his genius and writing doesn't let Nathaniel be the ultimate victor. Now carrying on with that thought, a couple pages we we cut over and we get where Valeria adult Valeria has come from the future and she's talking to Sue and explaining some things some ominous portents about like you're gonna have to go through some of the darkest times and you're not gonna you're not gonna think you're gonna make it but you gotta push through push you know and it's very cryptic you don't know but it's very interesting reading but we also get uh where we see Nathaniel come out of his time he goes into this pocket that uh future Franklin has made and Franklin says, you know, oh, success, I assume. Yes, I'm the only Nathaniel Richards that's left. And Franklin says, perfect. And then collapses the door, dissipates the ground beneath him. And Nathaniel's like, what? And this was a shocker moment. I did not see this coming. And he's hanging on the ledge. And um, Franklin says, ah, that's going to be one seriously insane drop. Franklin, what, what are you doing? And um, it, it cuts back and forth to the Valeria Sue, but I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, you know, what have you done? You, I can't access my powers. And Franklin explains to him, basically, uh, I made it so you can't access your powers. Um, and he says, something significant was gained today. Val and I would rather not be wasted. Um, and then we cut back to Val talking to Sue, or, you know, about the dark future, like I said. And then uh, Franklin continues, all you have to do is let go, drop, and I'll turn your powers back on. Then you need to jump away, back to the new past before the revision hits. So one of the things that Sue's ex or Val's explaining, actually, is this revision. How, um, revision wave. I guess it's kind of important that I actually don't skip over all those parts. So I'll go back. So Sue, he sa she says to Sue, uh, there's a post-collapse. He acts as an... Or, Franklin's waiting in this pocket, and he's like, there's a post-collapse. He waits there as an anchor to change uh, for the changes that he has made. And when I return to him, I will serve the very same function regarding mine. We cement this new future that we have created with sacrifice. Mother, Franklin and I will die doing this. So after she's told her mom, like, you've got to deal with all this. You're going to punch through this darkness and, you know, she, she tops it off with basically saying, this is what's happening. We're basically making this this point in time, this anchor, and the future is going to catch up to it, and it's going to be revised based on what we're doing. But we have to die to make this happen so that their, mm -hmm. their, their, their present selves, when they catch up to that point, will change how it goes. They'll, they'll take over, essentially. Um, again, this is really difficult to explain because Hickman puts so many big ideas um and uh yeah and uh so uh nathaniel's is like that doesn't work that way because he's talking about uh just let go blah 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 turn your powers back on it doesn't work that way if i don't jump from a fixed point 
And while falling towards the wave, there's no telling where I'll end up. I'll be lost in time. And Franklin says, I know you'll find your way. And uh, we're not arguing about this. Crack, and he stomps on the ground. Franklin, stop! And he grabs his leg. Listen to me, listen. I'm now every Nathaniel Richards that's ever was. I'm probably, it's probable that I can't even be erased from space time. Even if I stay, I could survive the revision wave. So Franklin says, there's no guarantee of that. We both know it. Damn it, child, but I want to be here. Why are you trying to take that choice away from me? Um, And he's positive looks aside it's dad see when you collapsed uh every you into reality when immortus commanded the great hunt and the culling of all the nathaniel richards and even though you didn't mean for it to happen you made every reed richards that's ever existed into an orphan it's what's wrong with them it's what's wrong with all of them don't you understand Every boy deserves a father, especially mm. mine. I love you, Grandpa. And he stomps away and he falls into uh, this whatever abyss thing. Um, mm. And wave. wow, when I first when I first read it, I thought he said especially me. Every boy deserves a father, especially me. And it, it, the, the scene didn't resonate right. It it, it it worked okay, fine, but when I saw that it was like oh wait especially mine he's not sending i thought he was just kind of like being a dick and sending his grandfather like you go fend for yourself you know what he's doing is he's sending his grandfather back before the wave so he doesn't have to go do all those things that he did and we that opening scene back in volume one where it's reed richards in the past and he's working on the car with his dad and his dad's like i gotta leave you and he's like what what do you what do you mean you gotta leave Reed Richards never had his father. And I really relate to this, just my own growing up and lack of parentage in certain areas. Like the fact that Franklin like figures this out, I, I like number one. I, I don't like the super genius Valeria that just knows everything. Um, but this idea that like he's not doing it for him, he's doing it for his dad. And he sees that his dad is broken because his dad didn't have a dad and he's fixing that and he's willing to die to make it happen like just i was like man when i put all these pieces together i was like oh the scene is so much bigger than i understood and so that mm -hmm. is my impact moment number three that it just um just looks like wow like i just <laughs> i want to see where this story goes even more now and let me tell you, <laughs> this part, this scene was so important because this directly affects, man, it's crazy how like it, it directly affects the rest of this run and the conclusion of this run. But it literally does go farther than that all the way until into yeah. Secret Wars. Like it goes that far. Like this scene goes that far, like 40 more than like yeah more than 40 some comics later like it, like damn like 60 some comics later like it matters um immensely uh this this was my third scene so we can yeah just kind of stick with this and talk about it and that's what i was talking about how all these big brain concepts especially in this issue or the last two issues between everything with the T tva um, you know, uh, Nathaniel Richards, you know, having to ended up being the conduit for when um, uh, when that one thing got exploded or whatever, like taking all of that stuff and then bringing it back around to, to family like it all came back to family. He, he like Valeria goes and talks to their mother because they can level and they can get on the same, you know, what I'm saying like on the same level easier. And then Franklin decides to deal with Nathaniel, you know, because he can better deal with with that situation with his grandfather and and have him understand. You know, he understands what it's like to have a dad because his dad was there, meaning he that much more understands the, the issues that his dad has because Nathaniel was in and out of his life. And we get, an, uh, you know, another an additional explanation of why Nathaniel was in and out of his life. You know, with all that he was, you know, going and dealing with time, he, you know, he was, you know, screwing with time, and we, you know, we kind of know why. And of course, in Nathaniel's mind, you know, he's like, 
also kind of trying to protect his son because he was away from him, you know, so hoping that, you know, not having proximity didn't draw, you know, the other Nathaniels closer to him. <clears throat> you know, of course, I I like, you know, I've had conversations with my dad who's been in and out of my life, so I kind of understand a little bit of what they're lot, you know, how they justify some of these things. But uh to ground it back around for mm-hmm. it to be for it to be uh Franklin standing up for his father. And the crazy thing is that it works on the level of him standing up for his father to protect his father. So that way, as things go back and things are revised with the revision wave, Nathaniel ends up staying there so we can have a father and be that much of a better father to his two kids and be that much of a better husband to Sue and be that much better of an overall man, you know, maybe even a, a scientist, maybe, you know, to the world. But if not, just better to the immediate family. Um, it also impacts the larger story as a whole, you know, um, so. Yeah, just bring it back around to family, splitting it up and having the two different family members deal with the other family members. And um, yeah, it was just it was just really awesome. And then have those two family members come back together, you know, Valeria and 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 Franklin and have to, you know, accept their mortality and the sacrifice for the greater good that they're making in order for, you know, at the at the power and the understanding that they've gotten to in their lives and sacrificing all of that. So the past can get resolved properly and the past getting resolved properly is going to lead to a better overall future. It's just interesting, awesome writing that covers the head and the heart. Bravo, Jonathan yeah. Hickman. Absolutely. That's, that's the best way I think you could sum up the way Hickman writes. It involves, yeah, it's both the head and the heart, just the way he marries those two perspectives, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I would think um, one thing I wanted to to maybe um, discuss, or you said that he, he, because that Franklin knows what it's like to have a father, which I, I agree, he does have a father, technically. But I also think that he also knows what it's like to have an absent father. And we saw that earlier in, mm-hmm. you know, previous issues in this volume where Franklin's like, I want to go to the toy store, like, da-da-da. And Reed has to, like, break a promise. Like, I know I told you I would go, but this other thing is important. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think I think what Hickman's mm-hmm. doing there is he's establishing how Franklin sees his dad as constantly not being available because he always has something more important to do. And he recognizes that, that. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's, it's, his it's dad co- continued through their, their lineage. The father just, just did in a that different too. Way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the, the beginning of this whole story that in back in volume one, the dad's like, I got important things to do. I got to go. Yeah. And, and, and reads like, what you, what do you mean? You got to go. Like I've taught you everything I know you're going to be fine. I got, you know, and that's shaped how reed is and now franklin mm-hmm. is being shaped by the like he sees like his dad is there he hasn't completely gone yeah he's so like he's there more like, than nathaniel was there but it's still he still has a bit foot, of that mm-hmm. yeah he's got his foot on both worlds like yep i do have a father but i also not completely which is why i think why he's making this change like that maybe if his dad had had a real you know then his then then franklin's dad would be more um, and, and that's how I'm seeing it so far. Now, I don't have the luxury of knowing the future of these books like you because you've read. So this is a lot of speculative um, parts for me. But I think it seems to me that's kind of w- what might be happening that we're going to see a possibly changed read from the beginning of this book because the past has changed the present. And I'm I'm very curious to see where that goes um and how that affects um and you and you can't really answer me because it would spoil mm-hmm. so <laughs> that's right <laughs> but yeah I, but luckily the series is already out and printed we don't have to worry about cancellations or anything you're uh there is always hope ash and your hope will be rewarded because you will be reading and finding that out my friend and finally, and conclusion. because his hope lies in doom, his, ho- his hope that. does lie. His hope does lie in doom. Let's be very clear here. You know, let's make no mistakes about it. Ash's hope lies in doom. 
Uh, yeah. So conclusions. Uh, let's let's go to you, twin. Um, wrap wrap up wrap up this here little four issue. You know, sedity for us. It's a little deep. yeah. So we, I mean, yeah, we get this this great little. Uh, you know, this great little story right here, the last two issues with Franklin, uh, you know, future Franklin and Valeria and, and Nathaniel Richmond, Richmond, Richards, Ooh, need some coffee. Uh, you know, we great. And like, and like you said, Skip, this is, you know, this even goes beyond, you know, Fantastic Four. I actually remember reading uh, the Hickman Avengers run and this showed up like, this scene and fallout from the scene happened in an Avengers book. And I was like, well, why are the Richards in here? <laughs> uh, yeah. So just like the, the long standing repercussions that are going to come from this, I think we're going to be seeing that and reading that for, for a good while to come. But yeah, this, these four issues right here, I mean, they're good stuff. Uh, they're not, they're not big payoff stories. You know, we Hickman got the ball rolling with some, you know, setting stuff up the, with the last four issues we talked about. And then he kind of continues that. He's like, we're going to leave this on the stovetop. We're going to let things simmer, add a little bit more. You know, we're going to give you some quote unquote filler stories, some one shots, you know, Johnny Storm and Franklin at the toy store, or, you know, this little time travel story with Reed and Ben and, and Nathaniel and Doom. Uh, and you may think you're getting like a good little Hickman one shot, but, you know, we're going to find out as we go down the line, we're going to see just how important these stories are as far as setting up what's to come down the road. Uh, I think that, you know, just reading these by themselves, like isolated. Yeah, they're, it's good. It's good writing. It's Hickman writing. The art's good. It's good. But as part of a whole it's it's really it's gonna pay off it's gonna lead to a lot of really really good stuff and man next week ah, next week is the <laughs> i'm excited man yeah 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 ah yeah born. exactly it's like I'm just <laughs> i'm just gonna go sc scream into a pillow or something but uh yeah i mean but it's, and it's, it's the thing I love about Hickman is he doesn't just jump straight to the big stuff. Like the reason the big stuff hits so hard when he right. does get to it is because he took time on scenes like this. Yes. Like I feel like a lot of writers, they just want to get to the big stuff for the sake of having big stuff and for the sake of having the spectacle. Like right. you got to have the heart to go with the spectacle. And so, yeah, this stuff that the, this work that Hickman is laying down here, it's good, but you're not going to realize how good it is. I feel like until, you know, they say hindsight is 2020. And, you know, I think it's the same thing here. You're not going to realize just how important some of this stuff is. You may think it's good writing. It may be a good Hickman book, a good Hickman issue, but just how good we're, you know, when we're, you know, a few issues down the line, then you're going to be like, oh, wait, when he wrote that story way back when, that is what it was. That's where it was. Le this That's where the path started leading down to this point. So, yeah. Yeah. The reason why the payoffs hit so hard is because he invested so deeply into them, you know, and, mm -hmm. and right when you think maybe he's lulling you or rocking you to sleep a little bit. Oh no, baby. He's he's just he's just warming you up and getting you ready and prime and prepped. He's just he's just seasoning you because he's about to throw you on the roaster. You about to cook up. <laughs> That's for yeah, sure. You're marinating right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're marinating. Ash, uh final thoughts here as we wrap up. Um final thoughts are I wanted to dispute a little bit the idea of like the filler issues. I don't think there was any filler issues in this. The murder, well, the murder yeah. storyline was was a subplot, but it wasn't a whole issue. There was a lot more that happened in that issue we didn't cover. Um, and in fact, there was that, a big thing that happens across all four issues that we didn't cover at all, which is the whole the interlude of New Earth. Um, yep, we did not cover New Earth. We didn't talk about yep. that at all, and that seems insanely important. 
Oh, um, it is. It's far more impactful later. But that's okay because we I weren't doing we, a comprehensive coverage. We were just talking about sure. moments that stuck out to us. I think the reason we didn't talk about it is, of course, it, at this point, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You get to these interludes, and it's like, you know, New World plus 17 years, and we see, you know, a paragraph of something happened. New World, 105 years, a paragraph, something happening. And I think it's all going to be important knowledge later when it comes to a head. But right now, it's just sort of like, just setting the, the stages. Uh, but it is really intriguing. Uh, so even though with that Murder World book, it, you know, like I, I could I could have done without them. You know, it, it's a fun little story, you know. Like, oh, yeah, who's your favorite hero? You're like, okay, it's cute. But if that would have been the whole issue, I think it would have been a detraction. But because it was only part of the issue, and then you get the, you get the interlude stuff, and then you also get that really touching – Ben Grimm uh, story that I think mm -hmm. that makes that issue stand out really, really strongly. Cause there's three really good elements that are the, well, two and a half, whatever, however you want to look at it. Like there are three elements in that book that you can find interesting, not just one simple thing. Um, and so all of the, all these books, you know, there's only four issues per trade. But there's just a density of, of what's going on between character development, between plot, between subplots, between world building. You know, it's just, it's just talking about it is a challenge because there's so much to cover. It's not like a simple little thing. I have to like, I feel like I have to give all this backstory every time I want to explain a scene. I'm like, okay, I want to talk about this. But before, let me <laughs> cover all this to, so you understand what I'm talking about. And that's a good thing. Um, we definitely didn't do this the justice it, uh, it deserves of like reading it yourself. So if anyone is listening, if you haven't read these books, please don't 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 sleep on this. Um, even if you're not a Fantastic Four, if you think you're not a Fantastic Four fan, I all my life I've never really been a big Fantastic Four guy. Um, but reading this this. If, if Fantastic Four was like this all the time, I would be a huge Fantastic Four guy. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's just so much that Hickman put into this. And, you know, even like, you know, with how we felt about the first one, the second one, coming into the third one, knowing how it's it was designed and constructed, you know, purposefully gives me one perspective, but coming in and, and us really diving into the different moments and, and the things that stuck out to us again, it just continues. It's like, you know, film appreciation class just continues to give me a deep, deeper appreciation of, uh, of the art in front of us. Um, I know we didn't talk about it. Of course, a different artist from last time, but I really felt like this artist, uh, Edwards, let me see what's the Neil Edwards had some strengths uh, of, of his own that added to different scenes and poses and panels in its own way. So I, I like, though it wasn't the same at certain points, I, I definitely missed Dale Eaglesham, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I appreciate this aesthetic for this particular set of issues. Um, but overall, this book, took us through some things and then left us off at a place that is extremely exciting and makes you intrigued to find out where this place goes next. Not even like how it ends. Cause of course we, we, we want to know how it wraps up, but really just what, what the, what the heck even just happens next. And, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm excited, even though I know what's coming next. I'm still going to say that I'm excited to go back through that part. Um, this whole ah! I'm excited, yeah. Um, but um, you know, with 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 that said, <laughs> I, I almost there's parts of this book that I have said I've gone on record to say have literally brought me to peace. I mean, this book, parts of this run have made me stood up and cheer, like you know, out of my recliner, have made me cry, you know, just tear up a little bit, have made me weep, have like made me, you know, just f filled me with awe, you know, blown my, blown my mind, so many different emotions.
through this thing. But um, I'm just excited that I get to go with it, go through it with with three people this time and really break it down. So that's that's really exciting for me. So I appreciate, you know, you being here, Twin Ash. I appreciate you being here uh, with us on this journey as well. Everybody who's listening to this, um, hopefully you're reading it yourself and, you know, and pulling different parts out. Feel free to share what parts stand out to you in the chat. Um, feel free to share it, you know, in the comments. Uh, we'd love to hear, you know, what you have to say. And if, if we get enough of those, I can definitely, you know, bring some of those up. And maybe if we can kind of get them all together, maybe we do do, maybe we do do, maybe we do a final show after we do the final arc where we kind of talk about all that stuff. And then I totally be down to um, have us read and respond to some of the, uh, some of the comments uh, that we get in there. But uh, again, Ash, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Twin, uh, my buddy Zach, thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure to, uh, to do this with you guys every week. And y'all, come check us out on Twitch live. Skip, uh, excuse me, twitch.tv backslash Skipintosh. Link is in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us. And expect another one up soon. Later. <laughs>